I want to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the session. Uh, please use the Q&A box on the side of your screen. We'll aim to answer as many questions as we can in the Q&A session towards the end of our time. Uh, I should also mention, um, compliance requires me to, that this is for informational purposes only. Um, and should not be viewed as investment advice or an offer to buy or sell Pender's funds or the securities we mentioned. Any discussion of performance is not an indicator of future results. And all opinions are as of today's date um, and are just opinions, and we may not share the opinions of our guests. Uh, speaking of whom, today uh, I'm excited to introduce Cam Belcher as our session moderator. Uh, Cam's one of the leading M&A lawyers in, uh, in the country, practices at McCarthy Tetro. Uh, we've known Cam for quite a while, been involved in several transactions with him. Um, so he's, he's a long-standing associate of Pender's, having been on the board of Pender Growth Fund, our publicly traded private equity vehicle, for several years. Um, and one transaction we worked on together was QHR, which some of you may remember. Uh, he's the perfect person to get the conversation going about M&A and how Pender leverages our M&A expertise in our portfolios. Uh, second, I'd like to introduce Amr Pandya. Uh, many of you know uh, Amr from the Pender Investment Team's Air Transat Investment. Um, you know, it was highly, highly publicized takeover uh, situation that Pender shareholders or investors benefited greatly from. He has expertise in event-driven special sits with a primary focus on M&A and balance sheet driven special situations. Uh, aside from Transat, he's uncovered several top contr contributing special sits to Pender, including Mav Beauty and Maxar. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Amr, who has a, a short presentation uh, that will be followed by a round table discussion with Cam, Amr, myself, and then follow up with Q&A. So take it away, Amr. All right, uh, thanks, Dave, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this session on special situations how to successfully analyze and navigate M&A event-driven opportunities. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be providing an overview of Pender's approach to investing in M&A. So I think it'd be useful to provide some context on what happened to M&A activity in 2020 and how the M&A environment is shaping up this year. 2020 was really a tale of two halves in M&A activity. Uh, the first half of the year was turbulent with a significant decline in deal activity in Q2 with several large mergers falling through due to the pandemic. Many of the deals that did occur in the first half of the year were done out of desperation and necessity with the oil and gas sector seeing a wave of transactions. As government support and confidence increased through the back half of the year, there was a rapid acceleration of activity uh, with Q4 deal volumes reaching a decade high. And that acceleration has continued through to this year with M&A off to a record start with $2.4 trillion of global transactions through May. That's up nearly 160% from last year, the highest year-to-date total since records began in the 80s. Bankers and advisors are indicating that there's a large backlog of deals in the pipeline, and the second half of 2021 could see a similar pace of activity. One of the key factors that is driving this activity is that companies are sitting on record levels of cash with record low interest rates. The cash holdings of S&P 500 companies is approaching $2 trillion, which is up nearly 25% from year-end 2019. So materially more cash on the balance sheet of companies today than pre-pandemic. Private equity firms are also sitting on a record level of cash with over $1.5 trillion of capital raised and looking to get deployed in the next couple of years. The pandemic has accelerated a digital transformation, which is requiring companies to invest in technology and infrastructure as they find new ways to engage with their customers and service their clients. If these capabilities can't be developed internally, companies are looking to go out and acquire them, which is driving deals. Another key factor driving M&A activity is confidence in the economy as vaccination rates trend higher in developed economies and they start to reopen. Governments have been signaling their intention to continue supporting the reopening with monetary and fiscal stimulus, and companies have taken notice. With a recent study of uh, surveys of thousands of executives at global firms indicating that nearly half intend to announce an acquisition within the next 12 months. Special situation investing and MA event driven investing in particular has always been a part of Pender's circle of competency, but in the last year, there has been such a high level of event driven investment activity 
we decided to spend some time within the equity team breaking down, defining, and developing a formal process for special situation investing. The way we think about special situation investing is the merging of our investment process with an event-driven probabilistic framework, where we're trying to assess what is the probability of an event occurring and what is the impact of that event being realized will have on the company's share price. So in the context of M&A, it's determining the probability of a company being acquired and our assessment of that company's private market value. So with the application of that process, you can see how we have a unique track record of identifying M&A catalysts with 68 acquisitions or takeouts since 2010, 63 of which have closed. So on average, nearly six takeouts per year across our equity funds. We're currently undertaking a project to analyze our hysterical takeouts, determining if there are particular insights, signals, or correlations that can help refine and improve our process of identifying M&A catalysts. Reviewing the last five years of acquisitions, we found that on average, takeout premiums have exceeded 30%, with many of the targets we identify falling into our circle of competency in the IT sector and within Canada. Uh, we've also found that the strategic motivation of mergers have shifted away from scale to scope as businesses look to acquire or add capabilities and expand into new markets. In many cases, there was already a customer or service relationship established between the choir and the target, which may have provided the initial insight for the acquisition. Our takeout experience has largely been companies selling from a position of strength, with all transactions over the past five years having been friendly offers and with the majority of the target companies we owned in a net cash position. Takeouts have the potential to provide positive, non-correlated returns, and we continue to improve and refine our process of identifying M&A catalysts. We rarely invest in a business expecting it to be acquired. Uh, it's really a byproduct of our process, the private equity approach to public markets with the scuttlebutt analysis and due diligence that we undertake, allowing us to identify these catalysts. This includes a focus on understanding the incentives and motivations of management, spending time getting to know the founder or large owners of a company and what their expectations are in terms of the value of the business and their time frame of realizing that value. We'll look at the industry and the business operators and identify potential acquirers. One of the valuation methodologies that we use is the private market value, or what the company is worth to an acquirer and we'll determine an estimate of that figure. Once we determine private market value of a company, we'll assess the potential of it being acquired as well as remaining a going concern and apply probabilities to those scenarios to calculate an IRR. In many cases, we'll work with management, either through expressing our views or sharing our insights and advice when we do speak with them. In some cases, we may get involved more actively, including through board representation. Through this process, we can help drive liquidity events or an eventual sale of the business. So through our experience of M&A investing, we've identified several factors that correlate to identifying potential takeout candidates. Think small. Smaller companies can be easier to acquire with more natural acquirers, and the scale synergies can be easier to capture, making a deal more financially accretive to the acquirer. Good businesses. Businesses with strong management teams, market-leading products and services, and improving fundamentals, which makes them an attractive investment to us, are likely to be an attractive takeout target for an acquirer. Valuation. If we identify a business trading at a large discount to private market value, it's likely so will a potential acquirer. Industry disruptors. If a company is shaking up an industry, outcompeting incumbents through a disruptive technology or strategy, competitors are likely to take notice and look to acquire that disruptor. Active consolidation. Certain industries are undergoing consolidation, so we tend to monitor what active consolidators are doing and identify their potential targets. Disgruntled owners, a frustrated shareholder base are motivated sellers and be more or less anchored to historical or high expectations. The presence of activists. Activists can be a catalyst for change with influence over the board. Our preference is for activists to be friendly champions, but there are also cases where activists will act as hostile agitators, pushing for change, which can also be effective. Motivated sellers. A founder or large shareholder looking or needing to exit their position in the company can be a catalyst for a sale. So a non-exhaustive list of factors we look for to identify potential takeout candidates. In addition to help us identifying these targets, 
these factors also improve uh, our process and help us avoid investing in businesses that could be potential value traps. For an acquisition to take place, you need a motivated buyer. So we spend a lot of time researching potential acquirers of businesses, understanding their motivations and incentives. Synergies are a common motivation for a merger, where a merger can make the sum of the combined entities more value than the sum of their parts. These synergies can come in the form of cost synergies or revenue synergies, with cost synergies typically easier to achieve. Growth expectations for a company and the incentives for management to achieve those expectations can be a driver to quickly acquire growth through an acquisition as opposed to growing organically at a slower pace. There may be a consolidated an industry that is looking to strengthen their market power, and as an industry gets more concentrated with fewer competitors, they may gain pricing power with both customers and suppliers. Uh, a target company may have an asset or capability where the value isn't being realized or a lack of resources where the acquiring company believes they can unlock that hidden value through a reorganization of the target. Particularly in R&D and human capital businesses like technology companies, an acquirer may undertake M&A to pursue a competitive advantage. This can include intangibles like patents and copyrights, advanced R&D, or unique skills and talents for management and employees. Agency issues can also drive M&A with management motivated by their own personal compensation growth and the prestige they get from empire building. As this may not be uh, to the benefit of shareholders. Acquiring tax loss pools or structuring a transaction in a way to reduce tax liability can also be an incentive for a merger with a target company. Finally, a type of activity we see often are businesses making an acquisition to expand into a new market. After going through these factors, we apply them to determine the private market value of a target company, understanding the values of synergies that can be realized to a potential acquirer, and then adding that to the value of control over management, capital allocation, and strategic decisions. The value of these two factors determine the potential acquisition premium that an acquirer would be willing to pay for a target company's standalone value. In addition to a motivated buyer, a successful takeout typically requires a motivated seller. So when we're assessing the takeout probability of a company, we look at the motivations and expectations of owners of a business. A company with an aging founder with a lack of succession plan can result in the founder being motivated to sell their business to monetize their ownership. The presence of activists can influence shareholders who've historically been supportive of management or the board but now see a new potential path to unlock value. After a prolonged period of underperformance, shareholders in a business may be frustrated with management and receptive to a sale with, with lower price sensitivity uh, in valuation. Businesses in niche industries may, lock, may lack growth opportunities after achieving a certain level of market share or penetration. And as the priority for the company shifts from growth to harvesting cash flows, being acquired by a larger business that can realize scale synergies may be the best outcome for shareholders. A change in landscape or industry disruption can be a motivating factor for sellers. Certainly the pandemic has disrupted many businesses and the owners of those businesses may prefer to monetize their ownership or merge with a large entity with greater stability. The unlocking of hidden value can also be a motivating factor for owners of a business to sell especially when that value is unlikely to be realized without the business being acquired. In a merger, access to capital, new distribution, and expanded cross-selling capabilities may create more long-term potential value for shareholders of a combined entity and could be a motivating factor to sell. The short-term nature of public markets can make it challenging for founders of public companies to make long-term strategic or capital allocation decisions with longer payoffs. There are also direct and indirect costs like management's time and attention to, in being a public company. This can create an incentive for founders to monetize a partial interest and go private along with a financial or strategic partner. Evaluating these factors from the perspective of a seller while understanding the motivations of potential buyers can increase the probability of identifying a target with high takeout optionality. Charlie Munger's quote, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome, certainly holds true for the management of companies. As part of the due diligence we perform when assessing a company, we spend time looking into management incentives and have identified compensation and governance signals that may suggest M&A is on the table. One of these signals is unusual amendments to Executive 7's plans. In many companies, management may have a close relationship with the board 
and when there's a high potential that the business could be acquired, the board may ensure that management gets compensated through severance plans. This action can also provide a helping hand to management teams who may lose their job in an acquisition where the acquirer is likely to make management cuts. The board may also reward management who may be critical to negotiate a deal or to incentivize them to continue operating the business as the sale process is underway by issuing new incentive compensation. Finally, management performance compensation is typically awarded through restricted share units, performance share units, and options striked above market price at the time of issuance. If management fails to achieve tar targets and thresholds required, they risk losing all or a substantial portion of their compensation. This can create an incentive for management to seek out an acquirer as the acquisition may be uh, result in the incentive compensation targets being achieved, or in many cases, there may be a change of control trigger, which immediately vests this compens compensation when the business is acquired. So we're finding governance signals increasingly useful in identifying businesses with high takeoff potential. With our framework for M&A event-driven investing, we may get involved at any stage of a transaction with a different investment and probabilistic analysis focus at each of these stages. But before a deal is announced, we're focusing on identifying characteristics we believe could lead to a potential sale. After a strategic review is announced, we're determining an estimate of private market value and the probability and timing of a sale in order to calculate an IRR. After a definitive agreement is announced, we're focusing on the deal risk, assessing the potential for a higher offer, and analyzing the risk to reward of holding through to closing. Finally, if a target company has experienced a deal break, more investors have likely sold their position and merger ARB investors will look to abruptly exit. And this could create a dislocation in the company's shares, creating a potential investment opportunity. An area where we've expanded our M&A focus in the past year is what we identify as bump arbitrage opportunities, which is an acquisition target with a definitive acquisition agreement in place, but where we believe there is high potential of a raised offer or the potential for a new bidder to emerge and a bidding war to take place. These situations can offer favorable risk reward characteristics as a raised offer is likely to be received in a short time frame, shortly after the deal is announced and prior to a short shareholder vote on the deal. To find these opportunities, we look at the market reaction to a deal to see if owners are selling and if the merger ARB spread suggests a high probability of a deal being rejected or raised. Shareholders of the target who believe the offer undervalues the company may express that opinion through statements or letters to the board. In these situations, our analysis is focused on determining how thorough and competitive the sales process was run. Did management have incentives that skew towards the sale rather than maximizing long-term shareholder value? Does the acquirer have the capacity and willingness to raise their offer? Are there potential white knights who can get involved and make a higher bid? The valuation analysis we perform in these situations is similar to merger arbitrage analysis, going through the deal structure, the timeframes to closing, the risk of a deal breaking, and ideally, if we think there's high probability of a raised offer and we can purchase the shares at a discount to the offer already on the table, that provides a favorable risk reward setup. This chart highlights some of our arbitrage investments that uh, we've had across our equity funds over the last few quarters. Uh, after we identify a potential bump arbitrage opportunity, we typically wait until closer to the shareholder vote to initiate a position. Uh, this uh, inquirers may be incentivized to wait as long as possible before raising their offer, and this also provides a higher IRR on, on our investments. These situations can offer uncorrelated returns, which may be low, but can materialize in a short time frame of weeks and in some cases days. Uh, Alaska Communications is a U.S. telecom provider that was the target of a bidding war. Rocky Mountain Equipment is a Canadian company that was the target of a management take private transaction, but a board member who owned more than 10% of the company dissented to the deal and the offer was raised days after investment. Dorel was the target of a management take private with a large dissenting shareholder rejecting management's offer. The offer was raised and rejected again, which ultimately resulted in the deal being pulled. Uh, we exited our position prior to the dissenting shareholder rejecting the new raised offer. Collectors Universe had an offer of $65, which was viewed by shareholders as undervaluing the business. With growing dissension among shareholders, the deal was unlikely to be approved, so the acquirer raised their offer to $92. We continue to find arbitrage opportunities in the market. Uh, just looking at the Canadian M&A landscape, which recently experienced two large bidding wars, 
CN and CP both vying to acquire Kansas City Southern and Brookfield and Pemna pipelines vying to acquire interpipeline. As we've defined and developed our process towards special situation investing, we have some exciting announcements coming up to our fund lineup this year focused on these opportunities. The Pender Special Situation Fund, which invests in the full spectrum of special situation investments, including M&A adventure and opportunities. This fund will have a one-year track record in July, and we expect to open the fund for investment thereafter. Also, a new merger arbitrage mandate, which we intend to launch in the fall of this year. Uh, we see this mandate as an extension of our M&A adventure and process, leveraging the experience, insights, and due diligence undertaken as part of our focus in identifying takeout catalysts and extending it to the final stages of acquisition. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, please submit your questions for the Q&A in the panel on your screen, and uh, we'll move to the roundtable. Thanks, Amar. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, my job is, as an M&A lawyer, it actually is to try to keep these things as quiet as humanly possible. Uh, when there is a leak, it's not because uh, the investors are, are so smart. It's usually we just blame the investment bankers for making the leak uh, is, is our common MO. But it's interesting to hear this perspective in terms of some of the indicia that you provide because we actually go to great pains as we're going through a process in particular to try to keep the thing as, as quiet as humanly possible. Um, I think one thing that might help the audience is, is could you just take us through a real life example, a recent takeout example to understand what your process is at Pender in terms of, you know, what are, what are the building blocks as you, as you go through an a analysis of the potential transaction or a, a live transaction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so last fall, um, Clearwater Seafoods, which is a business we owned in the small cap fund, was uh, acquired. And Clearwater is a Canadian vertically integrated producer of seafood spanning from harvesting to distribution. Their assets include a fleet of shipping vessels, um, processing and distribution facilities, and fishing licenses for a variety of shellfish species. Uh, being a capital intensive business with commoditized products, it's not an investment we would typically invest in, but I had followed the company in the past and in early March of 2020, they announced a strategic review. And what increased our confidence about the potential for a sale was the fact that the two founders of Clearwater, who together own more than 60% of the company, were both in their mid-70s and had been undertaking actions which suggested to us that they were serious about estate planning. The strategic review being initiated by the company indicated to us that there was a willing and motivated seller, which is a necessary part of the equation. There was also been offers in the past to acquire the company, which had been rejected, but that illustrated to us that there was strategic requires for the business, and importantly, they were Canadian-owned, which would be a requirement in order to gain the fishing licenses. So we started doing more work on the company, but the pandemic hit and our priorities changed. Uh, we revisited the idea in the summer around July with the share price around 550 at the time, and it appeared that the company was running a thorough sales process, and, when, and we focused our analysis on determining a private market value, and we estimated that the company might be worth 750 to 850. So with the shares around 550, there was good upside to our estimate of intrinsic value, a sufficient margin of safety on the valuation, and we were nearly five months into the strategic review. So we thought the risk reward was favorable and initiated the position in the company. Um, over the next couple of months, we found more scuttlebutt that suggested to us that negotiations and approval were moving ahead, uh, increasing our confidence in the deal. In October, there was a news release leaked rumoring that there were multiple bidders for the company with premium brand holding the front runner. And that aligned with our expectations for a competitive sales process. And then finally, on November 9th, the company announced a deal to be acquired by premium brands and the Micmac First Nations for 825 a share. So I think it gives an idea of how we approach an M&A investment, uh, especially when it's not in our core circle of competency. Yeah, I, the, the, I mean, the other, on your point on the understanding the the shareholders involved, I mean, there we had a had another investment which was recently announced that was being acquired called Cloudera, and that was a situation where several years ago we there was two companies we followed Cloudera and another company Hortonworks, and those companies merged, and as in the case of a lot of mergers, you know synergies are hard to come by, and there was some cultural clashing, and as a result company laid a couple eggs coming out of the acquisition. So the stock price just got absolutely hammered. 
and we were looking at it and you know the the company started selling the the enterprise value of the company was actually the 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 enterprise value of each of the individual companies pre-acquisition so you know we were sitting there we're like okay we got a pretty big margin of safety here and we also know that you know the the horton works had actually sold itself once in the past so there was people around the table who you know would probably do the right things if uh if a bit emerged and we so we made it we bought a position in the company i think it was around four or five dollars um and then about a month after carl icon gets involved so i mean presence of activists is always wonderful for our takeout thesis um and that uh, that caused the stock to rally and i think subsequently led to the the sale of the company here at about 16 dollars um just in the last month yeah i think it's a great observation on both your parts relating to the role of of founders and and selling and the motivation of selling shareholders i mean another real life example that hasn't come to fruition yet that's out there that uh it, on, on a very very large scale is of course couche tard in quebec um, the uh, the large large scale grocery op or small convenience store operator they have a multiple voting share structure where the control is vested in four founders and under the terms of those of those multiple voting shares they convert to regular voting shares and therefore there won't be a control block uh, when the youngest of the founders turns 65 and that happens this fall so so watching things like that or watching what's happening with the actual capital stack is uh, I, I think absolutely critical in terms of, of understanding motivations and then in terms of motivations of the buyers. One thing I was interested in, Amar, in your presentation was you mentioned scuttlebutt due diligence, which is a legal term, I think. Um, can you just speak a little bit about some of the non-traditional scuttlebutt type sources of information that you use uh, to, to pull together some of your intelligence? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Twitter can be a tremendous resource, um, very helpful in leveraging the analysts and scuttlebutt of other investors. You can also gain immediate feedback on a capital market transaction. So as soon as the deal is announced, um, essentially in real time, you can get feedback on what buyers and sellers think about the deal. Um, expert networks can also be very insightful in our analysis. We subscribe to a service called uh, Tegis, which provides interviews and transcripts of interviews with former executives, industry experts, and former employees. Um, we'll also utilize em employee anonymous review services like Glassdoor. So former employees share their opinions on the culture of a company and their perceptions of management. Um, Blind is a professional anonymous social media app. It's focused more on the TMT and finance industry, but uh, professionals share information on things like compensation, hiring trends, and employment recommendations. And you can also get a sense of where the top talent in an industry is shifting to on this app. Um, I've also found that tracking the lobbying registry for the government of Canada can be helpful, uh, especially when there's a deal that requires government approval. So for example, in the case of Clearwater Seafoods, um, we knew that the sale of the business would require the approval of the government in order to transfer over the fishing licenses. So we started tracking uh, Clearwater Seafoods lobbyists. And while the lobbyists historically met with the Department of Fisheries once every year or two years, um, we found that he had met with the department multiple times in the spring and the summer. And that led us to believe that the company was running a full process and might be getting the necessary approval for a sale. Yeah, I think yeah, scuttlebutt is a highly technical term, Cam, and uh, was originally coined by uh, for us, Bill Fisher, who wrote the book, Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. And I mean, we talk about that because I think it really ties into our, our, our background in private equity and how we employ our private equity approach to public markets, which is really digging in into the industry and talking to people within the industry, um, either competitors, suppliers, employees at the company, and, and, and getting, you know, getting an alternative uh, hypothesis potentially on, on what's going on, on with the business. And I think I remember uh, on one file we were working on, Umar was tracking private jet charters, um, trying to figure out if two management teams were talking to each other down in the down in the U.S. to see if we could, you know, figure out what the probabilities of a transaction actually occurring were. So, I get, you know, really trying to dig deep and get some get some insightful information. Um, but it, a lot of it's driven by our, our deep industry expertise, and and particularly I think that's why it shows up a lot in the tech sector. 
Yeah, I, I think that's bang on, Dave, in terms of the right analysis. I mean, just to turn it turn it to a, a legal side for a second, we organize ourselves on an industry basis. And the whole concept is get yourself embedded in the industry because we're chasing M&A deals too, just from a different perspective from you, not from an investing perspective, but we would actually like to do the transactional work. And, and, and clearly our lawyers that are more embedded in industries have more intelligence and know, know where you're supposed to go. So I think that's, that's absolutely bang on. Amar, I was, I was interested in your comment relating to management comp and analyzing management comp. Um, in terms of seeing activity, but are there other sorts of uh, M&A signals you can get from insider activity uh, beyond beyond management comp? Yeah, I mean, there's the traditional buying and selling uh, activity. Um, you know, generally a sell is a fairly weak signal. Uh, management can have multiple reasons why they want to sell stock. Um, a buy can be a stronger signal, but even there, um, management is you know incentivized and biased to have a positive view on the company. And it's a fairly well-known signal. Um, people track insider buying, and companies can sometimes use that to their advantage. Um, in terms of that, but that sort of trading activity, what can be a stronger signal is uh, what's known as a cluster buy. So it's multiple directors all buying around the same time period, and you know directors sit on multiple boards. They have full-time employment roles. They have a much broader view on the company. So if multiple directors, all with their diverse backgrounds and perspectives, are all buying shares around the same time, that could suggest that the company has a potential catalyst ahead, although they may not have a deal in hand if they're buying shares at that time. Um, you know, another just great signal that I find is very useful, just listening and reading through board statements and releases. Um, um, one of our takeouts this year in the value fund was a company called CoreLogic. The company had underperformed for several years. A couple of the activist investors got involved and tried to take the company private in June of 2020 at around uh, $65 per share. And their offer was rejected by the board. The activists initiated a proxy war. They replaced three board members, tried to replace additional directors. And uh, in response, the board put out a statement that they were looking to maximize shareholder value. They had received indications of interest to acquire the company uh, at around $80. And they would uh, expect to announce something by Q1 of 2021. So in January of this year, we noted that the shares were trading in the mid 70s. The board had signaled in this previous statement that an offer of at least $80 was likely to be announced shortly. So we initiated the position and six days later, the company announced they had an offer to be acquired by a private equity firm for $80 per share. Um, so boards have a fiduciary responsibility uh, and liability for the statements they put out. So when they signal that they have a deal and use language that or specify figures that suggest it's at a premium, um, we're certainly going to take notice. Yeah, it, it's when you're coming through the financial information, the, the, the proxies. I mean, I remember even even Felix, our CIO, got in on the party. I was looking at the SodaStream 20F, and he's like. Hey Dave, they just they changed the uh, management comp structure so that they get a big bonus on the sale of a sale of the company. And you know the reason they make changes like that is because you know they're probably preparing for a sale of the company. They're going to push it, or they've already been approached. So when you see signals like that in the in the proxy statements, um, or in the uh, the MDNA or the, the 10K or 20F in the U.S., uh, it could be a pretty good leading indicator that something's something's afoot. And you know, there's there's other things. I mean, I, I remember on Novus Energy, um, you know, they'd announced the strategic review, and when they filed their financial statements, you know, Ike was on page 27. The last line was, you know, we're we're pushing our AGM out by a couple weeks um, because we think we're going to have, you know, there there might be something else to vote on basically. So, and when you realize that they're pushing the AGM a couple weeks, they're probably like dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the final final agreement to be sold. Um, so, I mean, that was a situation where we we made a, a wonderful IRR because we were able to buy something about two weeks before the actual release came out um, just by reading the financial statements. Yeah, it's either that or, or, or somebody in the back office forgot to file their notice on CDAR at the right time, but uh, which just speaking from, from what I've heard is personal experience for certain people. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I am interested because I've been involved with Pender for a long time, and obviously you've got your value-oriented approach, which which is incredibly uh, attractive. Um, you mentioned that you know the takeouts and the special sits is a byproduct of your investment process. Can you give us an example of a, a holding where 
you know, the acquisition side is, isn't core to the thesis, but you think it's got a, a decent chance of, of occurring. How, how does that thought, how does that process work? Yeah. So, I mean, our thesis is, I mean, we're, we're business analysts, so we love finding wonderful businesses we can hold for a long time. The, the upside of that is when you find a wonderful business that we want to own for a long time, odds are another company is going to want to own it too. So it really becomes a, a byproduct of identifying great businesses. And, you know, a recent example of that would be a photon control, uh, which I would say started off as an okay business um, with some crazy governance issues that we, we helped the company work through. Um, and then over the last couple of years, uh, was just, you know, firing on all, on all cylinders. And as a result, an industry participant came along, took notice and, uh, and took the company out. So really it's, it's when you're buying higher quality businesses that you want to own for the long term, odds are as a passive investor, you know, you're not the only one who wants to own that company. Yeah, there can be uh, you know businesses that will invest in much more with a value focus that just end up being potential takeout candidates. So uh, we have a position in, in Bosch Health and the value fund. And Bosch is a company that has had a controversial past, but a new management team has stepped in, uh, successfully turned around the business. And our investment thesis is predicated on the company being undervalued, trading at a substantial discount to our estimate of intrinsic value with management undertaking efforts to unlock that value. And their focus has been much more about spinning off assets, um, but other activists saw that disconnect as well. And Carl Icahn, again, stepped in here, uh, acquired a large stake in the business in February, and uh, he shifted the management and board's focus away from spinning off these divisions to actually selling them. And the sale of one may trigger the sale of the entire company. So. Um, our thesis isn't based on a takeout, it's based on management unlocking value, and one of the easiest ways to unlock value could be a sale of the entire business. Right. Um, Dave, you, you and, and other members of your senior team, Kelly and others, have, have often sat on the boards of, of public companies. Have you learned things from, from that experience that have helped you through this process? Yeah, uh, and I think this really ties into what Amr was talking about, about uh, incentives and knowing the participants. So when you're when you're close to the board, you you understand what the end game is for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, if, if there's a probability of of companies being sold, I mean, and it also allows you to, you know, the the the, the companies can, you know, understanding what the CEO wants. It's, you know, when they come in marketing into your office once a year, or once a quarter or whatever on the quarterly annual results, um, you're gonna hear a canned speech. Uh, it's really when you get to know the people involved in the situation uh, where you can actually start to understand, you know, what what's going on. I mean, I, I kind of learned this the hard way where, you know, like the first company I was on the board of was a public healthcare company, um, an acquisition, uh, someone made an overture to the company um, and because management wanted to keep their jobs and they had friends on the board, it was totally shot down. And, you know, that was, you know, a 20 cent stock that in 12, in 12 months would have been, I think it was a $2 stock. Um, and that company actually ended up going into creditor protection and was a complete disaster because, you know, management wasn't aligned with the rest of shareholders and, it was really hard to affect change. So it's, it, when you when you get involved at the board level, it's much easier to assess those sorts of situations. Okay. Um, just one more quick quick question as part of the roundtable, and then we'll look, we'll uh, we'll head into the chat questions. Um, and, and this is a slightly different bent, but but serial acquirers, uh, those that uh, invest in businesses on the other side of the transaction. What's your thought process in terms of, uh, you mentioned, for example, premium brands, obviously, as part of the Clearwater transaction. What's your, th what's your thought process about being on that other side of the transaction, those that are, are serial acquirers? Amr, you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's obviously exceptions to the rules, and we hope that we own a few of them. But um, the reality is that acquisitions are difficult. It's successfully executed on, and it's usually better to be a seller than a buyer in an acquisition or merger. If you look at historical share return performance for of M&A, it's typically a wealth transfer from shareholders of the acquiring business to shareholders of the target company. Um, management teams have a variety of ways to direct capital 
They can return it via a shareholder, uh, via a stock buyback or a dividend. They can invest organically in the business, or they can spend on M&A. And uh, out of those options, it turns out that historically, uh, they spend more on M&A. And if you look at the incentives for management, board, their advisors, their bankers, it all skews towards doing more activity um, and not always necessarily to the benefit of shareholders. Um, so how do you make a good acquisition? The present value of your synergies need to be higher than the premium you're paying for those synergies to the target. And management can typically overestimate uh, their ability to realize those synergies with cost synergies being easier to actually realize than revenue synergies. So while there are exceptions, and we think we own a few of them in the cases of premium brands, um, in most cases, it's better to be a seller than a buyer. Maybe any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, you're being polite, Amr. I mean, the sellers almost always capture all the value. Like it's, it's very seldom the acquirer actually is the one with the better end of the deal. But to your point, you know, when you look at premium brands or Constellation Software, Mark Leonard, I mean, we, we sold a software company to Mark Leonard once and to one of the subsidiaries of Constellation. And at the end of the transaction, well, about halfway through the transaction, I was like, well, I know who's getting the better end of this deal. And, and we were the seller. And so that was, that's what really got me excited about Constellation in the first place. Um, but it's always, it's almost always better to be the seller than the buyer. And I mean, there's, there's so much empirical data that goes around this. Um, and it's not just the purchase price, it's actually the execution post as well. I mean, I mentioned the, the Cloudera Horton work situation where it was, you know, two, two really good businesses in a rapidly growing market. Um, they basically had, you know, they, they were number one and two in terms of market share. So it should have been a no brainer, but you know, integrating the operations of the two companies was really challenging. So, you know, it's not just price. There's also the operational execution post. Um, I think there's there's some things you can look for. Um, you know, we see some growth by acquisition companies that are, you know, maybe saying their price, you know, they're they're they're, they're price discriminant, but they're talking about forward EBITDA and synergies that'll never develop. But if you keep the hamster wheel going, you can do enough acquisitions to make the the, the financial picture so 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 opaque that you know people don't know what's going on until all of a sudden they're wondering why the stock's down ninety percent. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of those in Canada as well as the, uh, the really successful growth through acquisition companies. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a good observation. I have a very good private equity client. I remember I was closing a deal. It was about, this is about four years ago. And, uh, and, and he was sad and I said, but Brian, what's up? Like, this is an exciting day for you guys. You got a new business, everything else. He said, I hate, I hate sales processes. Well, why is that Brian? Because I know that I just paid the highest price that anybody else in the world would pay for this business and so so you need to be careful as an acquirer or the two examples i was going to give that uh, there's lots of exceptions to it obviously and 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 thanks for plugging constellation they've been a great client of our firm since they went public and we've done all their acquisitions and and they have an incredibly disciplined process i mean it's 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 phenomenal and and obviously what george has done at, at, at premium brands is another good example but i do want to uh, uh just turn this discussion because we've got about uh uh, 14 minutes left to uh, to some of the questions that um, uh, we're getting from from the audience. Um, so I'll just uh, Tracy Tidy uh, from Pender's been kind enough to kind of assimilate them and, and consolidate them. So if I don't get to your specific question, you can blame Tracy. Don't blame me. Um, the first one is uh, how patient will you be waiting for an event? Uh, why would you get involved to act as a catalyst for an event? So what about, what about patience and, and, and how do you play that card and, and when do you play it? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one, Amr. It's, um, you know, we, we're not, we're not activist investors by the stress by what people commonly think of as activists. I mean, the easiest way to make money in the stock market is to identify a great business, buy it and hold on for a long period of time. And that's, that's our mission at Pender is to identify those types of opportunities. Um, you know, where, and a lot of times we will, you know, we'll be very engaged with the management team and the board of companies. And our objective is to have, you know, help those management teams and boards grow their business over the long term. Um, but we do get situations that evolve where, you know, maybe there's a, a divergence of interests or, I mean, we've been, we've been investing in the full stack stage of technology companies for, 
for over 20 years now. And there's certain points in a, pro, a company's development where a CEO has the skill set to, to grow the company. And, you know, sometimes the CEOs can continue to grow their skill set and continue to build the business. Other times they reach, you know, they reach, they reach the wall. And so there's, you know, we, we try to be as patient as possible. Um, we understand building a business is hard. Um, but when the, the data is staring us in the face that, you know, something needs to be done, that's when we'll try to work constructively with the company to address the, the, the changes that are needed. Right. Uh, another question relates to the, as you call it, the bumpetrage. Uh, after, after a business you own is acquired uh, or, or it's been announced, do you typically hold the shares right through closing or what's, what's sort of your analysis as you go through, go through that part of the process? Uh, so Dave's uh, famous quote, a pender is it depends, and uh, that's certainly true for bumpetrage holdings after an extended agreement is announced. Um, really there, the type of work we're doing is, so we're shifting our focus. It's much more about um, like a merger arbitrage perspective. We're going through the merger docs, reassessing the deal dynamics, the closing risks, the potential for a higher offer, understanding if shareholders are likely to support the merger, and then developing that probabilistic framework for the various scenarios um, and the, our estimate of the probability of them occurring. And through all that analysis, we can calculate an IRR and determine if we should continue holding the position or in the event that we exit, is there a certain share price where we would consider reinitiating a position? So it, it's much more IRR focused um, at that stage. Yeah, really, it just comes down to a portfolio management perspective on whether or not you have better opportunities out there. Right, right. Um, we've got a couple of questions, Dave and Amar, relating to photon control, which uh, you're you're well aware of as a as a portfolio company. And maybe you don't want to answer these ones, but I'll put it out there in any event. From one of the participants, is uh, uh, they ob observe that the current market price is close to the, to the bid price, and do you believe that the uh, the offer price is undervaluing the company, and they might increase their offer? So that that goes a little bit into you know your analysis and the way that that relates and then the second sort of follow-up question was did you notice an indication before the M&A announcement they were going to be acquired um, so what were some of the signals there and, and were you aware of it it's maybe a real-life example of some of the things you guys have been talking about today yeah I mean that was that was one where when you look at the dynamics of the industry you know the semi industry has a lot of really you know it, it's it's pl it's a game played by the big boys and so it's an industry where everybody just gets bigger. So we do see a lot of M&A of smaller companies that particularly when they have a really interesting product or service that's needed within the industry. So it was always in the background that this was a potential outcome. Did we have any signals in the last year that this was potentially happening? Uh, no, um, but then, so I think I, then flipping to the, the second part of the question, you know, I think there was there's the speculation that a higher bid was going to come along. Um, I mean, we I look at the board of directors there. You've got Neil McDonnell and Rowan McGrath, who are two highly credible tech executives. They've they've sold quite a few companies over the years. So when you see people like that in the room, you, you know, the company is most likely ran a fulsome process. And you know, to tie back into your private equity client, the highest bidder was the winner. Um, so we took the opportunity to, to take money off the table when, when the deal was announced, it was actually trading through the deal price. And we didn't think a, a higher bid was going to emerge. So um, we, we sold shares. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Neil did a great job on QHR, I recall. Um, uh, a, a question that I have that's it's not from this list, but, but it probably impacts a little bit what's going on. So we're talking about motivated bidders and private equity and that sort of thing. Can you just speak about, I mean, SPACs is, is a question that I get, I'd say at least every 48 hours, a question around SPACs and the impact of, of SPACs. How, what's your perspective on, on the proliferation of SPACs and how are they impacting obviously valuations and but M&A activity and has it, has it modified some of your thinking about, uh, about any of this? Yeah, and I, this is, I, I chat with Maria about this a lot because she's on the private side. So, well, in our private company portfolios, you know, people are looking at the landscape right now. And when they're considering strategic alternatives, 
It's do we sell ourselves, do we IPO, or do we SPAC? And it's it's a full on part of the, the the conversation at a lot of lot of companies now. And I think what what we find really interesting about it is, you know, when the SPACs were being formed, it was it was an interesting opportunity from a risk reward perspective to participate in the early innings of those. Uh, but now we have this wall of capital that has to do a deal. And you know, if, if these SPACs don't execute a transaction, the, the promoters of the SPACs are gonna lose their seed investment. So they are, there, there is a high degree of motivation to complete transactions in with, with the SPAC capital that's out there. And there's so much of it now, and it has to be deployed kind of in the next 12, 24 months that it's, uh, it, will, it will create a lot of opportunities um, in the M&A space. So, it's, I think it's going to be a nice tailwind for us for the next 12 to 24 months. Another interesting aspect of the SPAC market is what we saw in 2020 and early 2021 was the public market trading at a premium to private market valuations. And that led to a number of private companies going public and IPOing and direct listing. And that spread has narrowed over the past few months. Um, so we're at a point now where the potential for private market valuations to exceed public market valuations, especially with this wall of capital needing to do a deal, um, could arise. Um, and that just creates interesting ARB opportunities and M&A opportunities across the sector and landscape. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We've been talking about processes, and, and uh, we often refer to what we call dual-track processes when companies want to do some sort of exit. And often it's the dual-track processes, well, they'll try to evaluate an IPO. This is when they're private. Or we'll, or we'll try to evaluate an M&A transaction. And now the dual track processes, and I've got three of them ongoing right now, is we're going to evaluate an IPO and we're going to evaluate a SPAC transaction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the landscape is, has, uh, has, has changed considerably uh, and, and, and SPACs have changed that considerably. It'd be interesting to see how it, how it goes now the SEC's got involved. Um, can you speak just a little bit? So this is a good question. I like this one. Um, what, is, what has been your biggest winner uh, but also, what's been your biggest loser, and why? Um, so I, 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 what I, I we're, we're talking about M and A here, so I think it's I, I'd like to tie it in with that a little bit. And you know, I think QHR was obviously uh, a home run for us. I mean, we originally we were buying shares in the forty cent range, um, and we continued to support and buy stock in the company right up to its eventual sale to Loblaws or Shoppers Drug Mart um, a few years ago at over over three dollars per share. So you know pretty much a, a 10x over I think a, a six or seven year year holding period. Um, that would that would be one of our bigger winners. And it was also it was, it's a bit bittersweet too because you know QHR was it was growing nicely. It was still middle innings of a of a pretty big market they were going after. Um, so we, we felt we could have held that for another five, 10 years and, and continue to compound. But yeah, as, as we know, if we, if we buy companies we want to own, other people want to own them too. And sometimes they'll pay us more than a fair price. The, on the, on the, the biggest loser side, um, it's, I mean, it's a small cap investing. Um, so, you know, our, the hit rate isn't always the highest. Um, but on, you know, like one of our, you know, one of our one of our least satisfying investments, I would say, would be like BSM Wireless, um, which was you know they bought Webtech Wireless, and uh, we thought they had an opportunity to accelerate growth uh, in the Canadian telematics space. Um, but just you know, for whatever reason, you know that that wasn't that thesis wasn't able to play out, and you know because they you know they they failed at achieving growth. Um, you know, we, the company was sold, um, but it wasn't sold for anywhere where, where we thought we would get to when we, when we initially invested. When I get asked, you know, what's, what's your, what's your greatest weakness? I always just say it's, I'm way too intense and committed to my, to my client. So it, it's, it's hard on the rest of my personal life. That's, that's, you know, you need to work on that kind of answer about, uh, about, about that around intensity. I know that's always an issue for you. Um, uh, the uh, last question, I think, before before we wrap it up, which I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, this because we're always thinking about, again, we talked about industry focus earlier. Are there certain industries or sectors that are more prone to M&A than others? 
and and using your crystal ball or even the, the present time what industries and sectors are you are you thinking about now that uh, are active and, and certainly have some runway yeah so i can start um so I, I do think there are certain sectors that have higher fragmentation which leads to more m a and there are also various sectors that have distinct m a cycles so um, in the resource sector for example I think M&A tends to be fairly pro-cyclical. Um, unfortunately, that's at the detriment of shareholders. But in these sectors, you see M&A activity pick up when commodity prices are high, when management teams and boards feel confident, and uh, at the same time, when valuations are correspondingly also high. Um, outside of the resource sector and certain capital-intensive sectors, there is just a growing pool of long-duration capital now, whether it's private equity or pension funds. And uh, they have the ability to be a bit counter-cyclical and opportunistic and make deals in periods of distress. Um, I think the technology sector is always experiencing M&A, which speaks to the breadth of the industry. Um, and the M&A focus there is much more on capabilities than valuation. So um, they're making acquisitions uh, year round, around the cycle. Um, and it's capital-like businesses predominantly in that industry. They have capital and cash on the balance sheet. So they can deploy it as they see fit. Um, there are also natural consolidators in that space, like Constellation and like Eng House. Um, so I think it's fairly broad. But even mature industries, as we're seeing today with the railroads, um, the CNCP, KSU transaction, and the legacy media space with uh, Warner Media and Discovery Communications merging, there's still a fairly robust M&A. So I don't think you could distinctly call out one sector over the other. I don't know if Dave has uh, any thoughts there. Yeah, I think the, like the two kind of more macro themes on where we identify to Amr's point are uh, one, fragmented industries where there is a ton of M&A consolidation going on. Uh, and then two is just following the big money. And, you know, what, what, you, private equity, we, we see them raising tons of capital. And right now there's a lot of capital chasing, uh, in particular software companies. Um, so, you know, where there's where there's capital and a desire uh, or, you know, these fragmented industries, there's a much higher probability of things happening. Um, the rest of it tends to be a bit more idiosyncratic. Um, you know, is, is there an activist involved in the company? Uh, is is management, I mean, one of our favorites is when, you know, the, the, the CEO's youngest child is going into first year university. And that's usually the point where it's like, well, okay, if we sell the company now, I can travel around the world. Maybe, maybe not in the world today, but, um, it's time for a phase, the next phase of my life. Um, so that that could be a wonderful little indicator as well. Um, so, but active consolidation in fragmented industries, as well as following where the private equity dollars are going. Great. Well, Dave, I think it's it's nine, and I'm going to flip it back to you. Okay. Thank you, Cam, and thank you everyone for your time today. Um, hope you enjoyed, and please uh, join us later today for our ESG um conference i think it starts at 11 or 11 o'clock so until then cheers everybody